much <laughs> talking. Come on, stream. Come on. All right. And we're live. All right. Uh, we're here today with uh, another speaker uh, talking about uh, sniffing satellite traffic, whispers among the stars, with James Pavour. Pavour? I didn't actually. Uh, yeah, Pavour. Pavour. Got it right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, we'll be taking uh, questions in the track one uh, live QA. Uh, do you want to give a quick summary of, of your talk for anybody that might haven't might not have gotten a chance to see your, your talk uh, right off the bat? Yeah, sure. So the, the quick recap of the talk is that if you use kind of simple home television equipment, um, you can intercept these radio waves coming off of satellites in geostationary orbit that are providing internet service. And what we found is that these internet services are often unencrypted at the internet service provider level, which means you get to see all kinds of nifty traffic. We looked at it from a bunch of different perspectives. We saw traffic going to like cargo ships and oil rigs in the ocean or to airplanes in the sky or to like wind turbines on the ground. Um, and across all of these domains, the talk kind of delves a little deeper into what an attacker might do with that information or how they might abuse these signals to cause harm. And then it concludes by talking about ways we can fix it by coming up with alternatives to VPNs, which tend to be very slow on the satellite connection. Awesome. Uh, so we, we do have our, our first question uh, with uh, RPTK 2015 uh, MVP question asker. Um, in your talk, you made an active attack by impersonating a ship response. Uh, I assume this requires you to spoof your source address, but ingress filtering and ISPs is supposed to prevent IP, sp IP spoofing. Can you please explain how you still did it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm not actually sure how that happened from an ingress filtering perspective. I guess the answer would be that it looks like they weren't filtering correctly. Um, because we were able to spoof in one specific network. It's worth noting, though, that the vast majority of satellite networks we looked at were not trivially vulnerable to TCP session hijacking because of the way that the sequence numbers were changed by those performance-enhancing proxies I talk about in my presentation. So there were only a handful of networks that were directly vulnerable, and they seemed almost designed so that each operator's like IP address was like a direct gateway to the Internet, which might be why the, IS, like, the individual customers weren't checking IP addresses for spoofing. Fair enough. So like if it, it was, if they were peering directly into the backbone of the internet, they might just trust that it's coming from a legitimate source already or already been filtered. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, you know, I think Hawkeye asked one that would really fall in love, uh, in love, in line with this. And it's, you know, why do you believe that these high profile enterprise uh, satcom customers haven't adopted and implemented a simple encryption in transit policy to stop this kind of snooping? So there are a couple of reasons. I think one is that, like I mentioned in the talk, VPNs are really slow, and that's what a lot of people think an encryption and transit policy would look like. And because of the way that VPNs interact with the internet service provider offerings, um, they often end up seeing this kind of false trade-off between privacy and performance. Um, that said, there are a lot of these enterprise customers, and when we reached out to them with responsible disclosure, the answer would be that they had kind of tried to implement like a TLS everywhere policy, but you're talking about kind of massive networks, like hundreds of ships at sea. And so there are a lot of systems that are just forgotten, like legacy FTP services or services that they think are behind some sort of firewall. And so they're willing to accept the risk without realizing that that risk includes a wireless eavesdropping threat. Yeah. And some of those ships have uh, a lot of systems that are just unknown, like they, someone, a contractor installed them at some point and they just got lost or forgotten and still plugged into a network in there somewhere. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in your talk, you mentioned uh, the performance improving proxies. And uh, uh, what, I, what I didn't understand was that that was something that would be run by the actual operator. Is that right? Yeah, so almost always that's the case. Um, there's no like technical reason a customer couldn't bring their own performance enhancing proxy. But generally, satellite, satellite internet service providers are acting as kind of benevolent eavesdroppers um, on your TCP sessions. And they're kind of messing with your TCP three-way handshake to make your traffic faster. And that's just kind of part of how they see providing customers with sufficiently performant satellite internet services. Got it. Um, you want to throw a question out there, Elle? Uh, you know, I was, sorry, I'm 
there is, you had a lot of feedback on YouTube. And a lot of what I'm seeing though is people going, could you do it with this? Could you do it with that? And I know you gave a bit of an outline at the beginning of your talk on how you did it. If somebody wanted to replicate this, play along with it, could you kind of give an outline, you know, from beginning down to software, what they would need to just start out with? Yeah, definitely. So I think the core bits that you need are some sort of satellite dish that's capable of receiving satellite television. Um, we researched the KU band, but there's no reason you couldn't do it in the KA or C frequency bands as well. Um, and then you need some kind of way to interpret what that dish is saying on your computer. We use this specific kind of professional grade a PCIe card, which I think the model number is on the slide deck. Mm -hmm. um, but you could actually get away with a bunch of like much less expensive cards. The problem with that is that you won't be able to listen to some of the more interesting signals, which use like 32 APS-K modulation and seem to do really poorly. Um, there are also some USB cards. Um, so you could do this with a laptop. You don't have to like build out a satellite spying computer um, to be able to play with this stuff. From a software perspective, um, the tool that I show in the actual like little demo video is I think what I would recommend first, it's called EBS Pro and it's designed for feed hunting. Um, and it's really intuitive and has an interface that's easy to use. If you're on the Linux side, the tooling is, I think, significantly worse. Um, so it might be worth spinning up a Windows VM to do this stuff. The other big tool in this space is something called Crazy Scan, um, which is around on some of these like satellite television feed hunting forums. And then once you have all of that lined up, if you're listening to older protocols, um, so the MPEG TS standard, Wireshark can actually just interpret those feeds directly. If you're listening to newer protocols, you have to kind of parse the traffic dumps. Um, unfortunately, the tool I talk about in my presentation is still awaiting our chance to publish it as we're trying to be careful not to release an attack tool into the wild before systems are patched. Um, but good. we were able to build it using the Python library called KaiTai, um, which is used for like parsing various protocol formats. And so it wouldn't be that hard to kind of put together your own GSE parser. Mm -hmm. What do you know what the like, uh, like the signal width is uh, on these? Like, like what, what level or like what grade of software defined radio would you need to like be able to receive these signals? That's a great question. I actually have no idea. I know that on the DVBS side of the software defined radio community, I kind of delved into this a tiny bit and it looks like being able to keep up with these more complicated modulation schemes is not something that your kind of standard SDR uh, software RTL, is able SDR to do. Is yet. do. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas these kind of like PCIe cards, I think they often use like specialized FPGAs for the signal processing yeah, and are right. just better at it. Right. Yeah, I had two follow ups on the previous question. One somebody was asking, which I find funny, is if you're using kind of like the old dish network up on your ceiling, do you need to go up there and kind of reorient it, the dish? Yeah, so that was actually a big frustration for us because it turns out that I don't have any fine motor skills. So there were like several hours between each satellite of me like swearing at various bits of hardware on the roof. Um, so what we ended up doing is purchasing this thing called the DISEC motor, which allows you to steer a satellite dish across the horizon. And you can actually just put in the specific location and geostationary orbit you want and direct it that way. It increased the cost of the attack a little bit, but because we were looking at, I think, 18 satellites in total, being able to hop between them without crawling onto the roof every time was a big benefit. Yeah, I can imagine. So, so uh, your, the parts that you had listed in your your talk were between like 300 and 400. What was the like extra cost of that automated rotor? I don't remember off the top of my head. I want to say it's around $100. Okay. Um, you need to be careful that you get one that correctly mounts to the dish you have because different ones have different ways of attaching. So it's a little bit less easy to just buy one off the shelf, nice. but it's definitely doable. Yeah, uh, I've done some ham radio stuff with with aiming antennas, and uh, it's always kind of up in the air whether it's going to work or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Have you documented any of this, like in a blog, you know, a GitHub, whatever it is that you're using? Yeah. So there are two academic papers that I'll, I can put into the the chat afterwards that talk about our domain studies on to terrestrial users and maritime users. And those go into a lot more detail. In particular, if you were interested in replicating the um, GSE extract tool, the appendix of the maritime paper goes into a lot of depth on like how we actually parse the GSE packets and how we deal with the corruption in the signals that we were getting. Cool. Uh, did you have a, a paper associated with the um, avionics stuff as well, or is that just- a... No, that's new for the hacker summer camp. So yeah. that was new stuff. <laughs> um, we're still, I think once aviation picks up a little bit more and we can get consistent data, we may try to publish something that's a little bit more robust, but because it was kind of a toss in the air as to whether or not there would be a plane out that day, um, right. we didn't have as much data as we wanted. 
Yeah, I mean, one one of my next questions was going to be like, what are the the future research uh, look like for you? Sounds like that's that's one of them. You got anything else like coming down the pipe that you want to do with this kind of thing? Yeah, so I mean, we're still looking at um, the that proxy that I mentioned at the end yep. of the paper. So that's kind of going through peer review right now. It's always hard to kind of convince academic peer reviewers that something can be both simple and novel. Um, so who knows how that's going to turn out in the end, but it's on GitHub and we're kind of working to make that something that people can hack on and use. And then I'm also interested in satellite security in general. I'll be talking at the aerospace village tomorrow for a little bit on other threat models to satellites around like space debris tracking. Um, and so just generally hacking satellites is kind of my, my focus area. Uh, sounds like a whole lot of fun. I, I think we were, yeah. Is, is there a satellite hacking village going on right now? Yeah, so I, the Aerospace Village is doing both aviation like last year, and then they've got all kinds of new talks on satellites this year. Yeah, I, I knew there was supposed to be a special event this year, but uh, we went virtual, uh, so, so <laughs> may, may, maybe next year. Um, uh, Hawkeye is asking, uh, is there any reason you didn't go with a parabolic antenna in your research? Uh, it seems that might the gain might increase with one. Uh, yeah, I think the gain would definitely increase with one. Um, the reason we use that self-sat flat panel is just literally because of the shape of the area we were trying to fit it in with a bunch of other things up there. And it was just the one that we ordered fastest. Um, but I think that a curved dish would do better and would be cheaper. Cool. Uh, I think oh, I think it might be being addressed in the village, but one of the questions on YouTube was, you know, you've talked about how you pull down information. What is the likelihood that you could push up commands as well and, you know, start a kind of attacking, well, not even attacking, but just impa uh, impacting what you're seeing. So I haven't looked a ton at transmitting on these internet feeds and if there's any authentication there, um, in part because it's just harder to get a license to transmit than a license to listen. That said, um, if you wanted to engage in like attacks against the telemetry link for the satellite, so actually steer the satellite and stuff, a lot of those communications happen in different frequency bands. Um, in particular, S-band is kind of the dominant satellite telemetry band. And that would require completely different hardware and use different protocols. Um, that said, the general threat model of like being within kind of this massive footprint areas, I think would still be relevant to think about in that context. Cool. Man, there, we've actually got a fair number of questions that we've we've backed nice. I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not I'm not trying to ignore your questions. Uh, Let's see here. Um, since this is just a DVB-S or DVB-S2, why not use one of the bazillion conditional access system solutions used for video broadcast? That's a great question. I didn't even, um, oh, so you're talking about the like streamwise encryption. Um, that's something that I talk about a little bit in one of the papers. I think these protocols are not well designed uh, from a cryptographic perspective at all. There've been a lot of vulnerabilities found in them, especially the proprietary ones, which seem popular probably because they have a good marketing wing behind them, but uh, also kind of doing a stream level encapsulation like these protocols do works great for television where you don't want everyone watching a proprietary uh, video feed, but it doesn't work well because anyone who has the keys can listen to their neighbor's traffic. And you'll often have one satellite transponder that's carrying the traffic of 20, 30, 50 users. And so it decreases the threat model a lot and is a big improvement, but it doesn't fix the underlying issues. And you mentioned uh, another, uh... Another solution that was uh, it was sort of a replacement for the the MPEG, which had been jury rigged to sort of take IP traffic. Um, uh, does does that have like the same level of like research involved in it? Is the same level of like vulnerabilities or something like that? I know that you, you're doing like probabilistic extraction of data from it, but um... yeah. So the MPEG uh, standards that are used for sending internet these days are something called multi protocol encapsulation or MPE and ultra lightweight encapsulation, I think, or ULE. And we looked at both of those. Uh, Wireshark has built-in support for them. So the threat model is fairly trivial there if you can get a good recording. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting about the MPEG context though is that building your own parser is a real pain because it's not a format that was designed for sending data, much less secure data. And so it's an incredibly complicated and convoluted way of getting IP packets from one place to another. I believe it. <laughs> all those <laughs> all those old things that are just like like oh yeah i'm sure we could fit this data in here somewhere it'll yeah. work right um one of the questions i saw on youtube is you know you talk in your you're talking your talk about how a lot of these are using you know old old devices obviously old operating systems 
And I don't know how much you went into the past, but what they were wanting to know is, have you seen any progression in what they're trying to do to actually protect this data? Or has it just been the same historically? Yeah, so there are companies out there that offer encrypted satellite internet services. It's often something a customer has to pay extra for or accept like significant performance degradation in the form of the VPN. Um, one big product in this area is made by NewTek. It's called Enhanced TCP or ETCP. Um, there was a WikiLeaks document uh, a few years ago that talked about how there were built-in backdoors for law enforcement and intelligence agencies, which is always the risk with using kind of these proprietary standards. But there definitely is an initiative in parts of the industry to encrypt traffic. I think it's just one of those things where the commercial incentives don't align with the need for customers. So uh, I, I just want to, like, uh, we, we previously talked about your uh, performance improving proxy, which uh, you mentioned uses Quick. Um, there is, uh, is there any potential benefits of, of just like using WireGuard instead of, uh, like it's another VPN, it's like you directly compare OpenVPN. WireGuard's supposed to like, it's simpler, it's uh, using UDP sessions, uh, should be faster round trip. Um, is there, did you look at that in comparison before you started working on your own uh, quick proxy? That's a great question. So we didn't test WireGuard specifically, although I would point out so that GitHub repository that's linked at the end of the talk um, for QPEP is actually a generic purpose like Docker test bed where you could easily install whatever VPN you want and simulate nice. the satellite link. Uh, that said, I think that a UDP based VPN like WireGuard will still hide the TCP three-way handshake. So it'll still send those ACK messages across the satellite link. Mm -hmm. And so it might be a little bit faster at like starting the VPN session but the encapsulated traffic is still going to be hidden from the ISP. And so they can't optimize it correctly. Uh, so you really need to split out the TCP sessions on the ground first, which most VPNs don't do because it'd be a little silly. Right. Fair. Yeah. And WireGuard's designed so that they specifically can't see those TCP sessions or what's inside. Right. Um, so uh, ch kind of changing, sp uh, uh, changing pace, sorry, uh, talking and reading at the same time. Um, <laughs> Uh, have you looked into like uh, Starlink? I know it's a it's a pretty hot topic that's going on right now. See if they have they are actively using any kind of encryption or anything else like that. So I haven't tested anything related to Starlink yet. Although that's definitely you talked about like areas I'd be interested in the future. That's definitely an exciting topic. Um, Starlink is in low Earth orbit, which does change the dynamics a lot uh, because the satellites are closer. You don't have the same problems with TCP through a handshakes, which means that using a VPN is generally viable because the latency is much lower, mm -hmm. um, although certain conditions can change that uh, if you have to make a lot of hops across the constellation. So I think that it would be easier for SpaceX to implement an encrypted service than it would be for some of these geostationary providers. Whether or not they do that is remains to be seen. Fair enough. And, and like the uh, receiving traffic, it's like because they're in lower Earth orbit, there's going to have a much smaller footprint. Uh, yeah, that's a great data. point. Like the Iridium low Earth orbit constellation, each of the satellites passes across the horizon in like seven minutes. So the area that an attack attacker can be is still too large, right? It's it's dozens of miles, hundreds of miles, but it's nowhere near comparable to a different continent. Yeah, were, were you looking at uh, like Iridium sa satellites as like your test bed? Like you didn't mention actually which which satellites uh, it's, were involved. Yeah, so we didn't look at Iridium because it's a low Earth orbiting constellation. Oh. Um, we made the decision not to name specific satellite operators fair, uh, fair. That makes sense. for, for like legal reasons, but they were yeah. geostationary providers over Europe. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've always found the Iridium satellites, like the, the, the story behind the Iridium satellites, super interesting. Um, like a, it's, just, it's just like a fascinating evolution out of Motorola. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, as the, you know, I guess, end result, if I'm up on the airplane on a cruise ship and I decide to pay for internet and I'm getting things like text messages, what can I do to protect the status? Something like a VPN enough to impact my protection? So the text message case, I think you're kind of, you're kind of in a bad spot, whatever you do, because that's <laughs> over the femto cells and you don't have a ton of control over what their back end looks like. But for emails and stuff, I so many people, more people than ever should be, were using just unsecure pop email inboxes and leaking deeply sensitive stuff over the feeds. And I think just generally using like TLS for visiting websites or pop three with TLS for checking your inbox is a huge step up for protection. And then if you're willing to take it a bit slower and have that latency problem, any VPN will be better than having someone spy on your traffic, in my opinion. I think this is going to be the first year 
uh, in DEF CON's history since the Wall of Sheep started that they did not get plain text pop or IMAP credentials. And that's only because <laughs> they're not capturing traffic. <laughs> <laughs> People attending these conferences should know at least that much. Yeah. <laughs> Making a lot of assumptions here. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I feel if, like if you're going to a security convention, you could at least not use pop. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. Yeah. Um, is there uh, anything else that uh, we haven't uh, brought up, like that you might want to um, talk about specifically? Anything that you might have like left out of your or your talk that because it got cut by time that you're interested in? Um, anything like that? There's not too much left. I think that like one thing that. So one thing that I kind of highlighted in the talk, but ends up not happening is that GSE extract is not in our GitHub repository yet. Um, but it's still something I'm aware of and trying to get out there for people who are interested in checking it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's definitely something that I hope will be out soon. Other than that, though, I think that the general idea of the talk is pretty, pretty straightforward, right? It's that unencrypted traffic, wherever you put it, um, should be encrypted instead. And satellites are especially frightening these case because of the way that their signal properties are. But really it's wherever you're using the internet, you don't know who's listening. And so encrypting end to end and being sure that you understand kind of how that works under the hood can go a really long way towards helping with privacy. That's great. Um, I, I know you mentioned uh, a one of the attack of using um, uh, the downlink of, of the satellites as a, uh, a way to like exfiltrate data. And I know that there was one particular attack uh, in history that made use of this and it was like somewhere in Africa and they, they figured out that someone was just driving a truck around collecting that data. Do you know anything about the attack? It's, it's been a year since I remember anything about that. Yeah, so I think it was by Turlet Group, which is a Russian state affiliated, well, depending on who you ask, state yeah. affiliated advanced persistent threat group. And yeah, they seem to have been using these satellite hops to make traffic just disappear over the internet. And I think that's a really intuitive threat model because all you have to do is be able to send a packet to the right IP address and you don't have to have any software on the place that you're sending it. Really, really sneaky. Uh, so uh, I can't think of any more questions. <laughs> uh, if anyone is out there watching the stream and is interested in asking more questions, we're still here for a couple more minutes. Um, Yep, my email is also at the end of the slide deck. Uh, happy to answer any questions there too, or on Discord or wherever. Yeah. Do you have any uh, any additional like resources you can share with us that we can just drop into Track One? Anything in that people might be interested in further research? Yeah, definitely. Others? I'll share links to those academic papers. Uh, there's also a preprint paper talking about the proxy um, that's hasn't been published yet, but mm -hmm. um, is generally the idea of what we're trying to get published. Um, and so if anyone has ideas to contribute to that GitHub repository or has noticed mistakes that I've made because I'm not a network programmer, I feel free to pop up an issue on GitHub. That, that's great. Uh, uh, RPTK2015 says, uh, how did you get to this project? Like what was your, your path to get here? Yeah, so it was all those earlier talks from, so there was the researchers in 2005, which was kind of academic. And then there were two talks at Black Hat DC in 2009 and 2010. Mm -hmm. And I was just fascinated by that as something that could be done and seeing which changed was really the starting off point. And then it started out as literally just a summer mini project. It was supposed to be six weeks, but we found so much information in those six weeks that I've sort of pivoted my PhD research around this satellite communications. And everywhere we look, it just gets more and more fascinating and honestly worse and worse. <laughs> Fair enough. So, you know, here between us, just between friends, can you tell us what was the most interesting piece of traffic that you kind of stumbled across? Oh, that's so hard. I mean, it's it's really a different definition of interesting, right? Like, I forget if I mentioned this in my briefing or not, but for example, there were two friends, like one guy was on a plane, one guy was on the ground, just like chatting about some wild dream they had where this guy's like mom popped up in a burning building and started trying to feed him. And like, so you get all this like real, you know, it's real people who are affected. And yeah. then like I mentioned being able to track this, this billionaire's yacht, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of a different world to know what the people in the yacht are eating for lunch that day uh, based off of the like web APIs that they're using to manage their their food system. And so it's just a different world of security problems. I don't think being able to listen to the internet is something a hacker expects to get from any perspective. And the fact that it's so inexpensive and easy in a satellite world 
is I think especially concerning. Yeah, that definitely like, yeah, not, not great. <laughs> Uh, we, we do have uh, someone calling out that uh, this is one of the coolest talks that they've gotten to, to see. Oh, and, I'm flattered. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a really good talk, and I, I'm definitely glad that I got to do this QA session with you. Yeah. It was fun research to do, so uh, have you, I enjoyed it. Have you talked to any of the – I know there's um, uh, there's some projects for, like, reviving old satellites uh, and talking with them. Have you talked with those guys at all and, like – like they, they might have like additional knowledge about like talking to satellites or um, different research projects that you might be interested in doing. No, I haven't done that, but it is a very, very related field, right? Because yeah. to some extent, reverse engineering a satellite that you can't touch is the same as exploiting one. A lot of the cases, it's really understanding the systems is the entirety of the security properties. And so, yeah, that's definitely a fascinating area I'd want to explore. Yeah, I, I do know that they, they've also gotten special permission to do a bunch of transmissions to satellites as part of it, as oh, part cool of the stuff. revival stuff. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, they did a talk, I want to say two years ago, about Mick Moon, which was their headquarters for satellite communications. <laughs> and, uh, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Some people are making references to Doxis work uh, from earlier DEF cons. I don't, I don't know how if, if that's necessarily related because Doxis is a cable protocol. Um, yeah, I don't know of anything about it. So if it is related, yeah. I completely missed it. Yeah. But definitely something for someone else to contribute. Uh, and the geek uh, is asking you about new radio and SDR again, which which we did briefly cover. Um, but so it, yeah, I think it's possible. Um, I think it's just a little bit harder. These things are pre-made and just easier to use and so widely available, but it's easier to just pick up just, a satellite tuner yourself. Yeah. Makes sense. I think you're getting a high compliments from Mav there talking about how this feels very much like, you know, the old Alexa Park content. So Wow, people are loving this. Yeah. Oh, I'm really flattered. Yeah, it, it was cool stuff to do. It was a little frightening at times, but really enjoyable research. And I think space is a place people haven't done a lot of exploring. I mean, there obviously are other people before me, but I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit for people who are interested in kind of living the, the days when hacking was maybe not easy, but terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, we're approaching the uh, end of the session. Uh, any final shout outs or anything you want to do before we sign off? Uh, one other thing I might hit on is I mentioned uh, electronic flight bags in the talk as kind of an interesting component of the aviation stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it at the time when I was recording the talk, but there are actually two, two village talks on electronic flight bags. Um, one happened yesterday by um, Matt Gaffney, um, and I thought it was really cool. And then there's one tonight by... David Robinson. So if you're interested in kind of the aviation side and what it might mean to hack an EFB, I definitely recommend checking those out. I know I will be. That's awesome. Uh, and I, I think that uh, at least the vast majority of our village talks are also being recorded and put on YouTube. Uh, I don't know specifically if that village is. Um, it's, it's an opt-in, opt-out kind of thing. So it was up to everyone. Uh, but cool. it, it may it may already be available on YouTube. The one yesterday may already be available on YouTube for people if they uh, want to go watch it as well. Uh, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this QA session. Thank you for making such great content for DEF CON. Um, thank you for being part of our virtual experience. Thanks. It was great. Great talking to you all. All right.